Welcome to the third day of Society of Construction Law India International Virtual Conference on Construction Law and Arbitration. I am Mohana Dilip Porduke, a civil engineer and lawyer and joint secretary of Construction Law India. Before starting with some exciting sessions lined up for today, let me make some important announcements. We have a couple of exciting activities where our delegates can participate. There is the Construction Law Trivia, which has been created by Atkin Chambers. You may visit the engagement room in the lobby area and participate till 2 p.m. today. The other is the photo booth, where delegates can go there, click selfie, and post on their LinkedIn page with a hashtag SCL India. We also have an exhibition hall where our sponsors have put up kiosks where you can meet them and learn more about their services and products. Those who have missed some sessions can visit the lobby area and click sessions on the left corner of your screens. Now that we have done with some housekeeping, let's begin the day with session 4B. The use of mediation for resolving construction disputes, an exclusive by Madhyam, International Council for Co Conflict Resolution. Madhyam has been a pioneer in the mediation movement in India and has actively participated in the policy and lawmaking in the field of ADR, including mediation. Madhyam has been developing and implementing training programs for imparting and promoting conflict resolution skills for ADR practitioners in close collaboration with local and global partners. Madhyam endeavors to embrace the best practices in international and domestic conflict resolution. Through its peer mediation and youth forum, Madhyam aims to capture and empower its immense young talent to be the leaders of tomorrow in building peace and reducing conflicts. I would now like to invite Mr. Anil Changaroth, Managing Director, Changaroth Chambers LLC, and Changaroth International Consultancy Singapore, who will introduce the moderate, who will moderate the session and introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night uh, to wherever you are. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure being here. Uh, well, it's virtual. Uh, I say absolute pleasure because the last two years have been that way for most of us, uh, you know, uh, virtually. I was last in uh, Delhi, I think, in 2019, uh, uh, December, and that was an exciting time. But, you know, we've, we, we've transited into a new world, so to speak. Uh, if we, I could just have my slides shared as well. All right. Uh, this is the panel that we have with us. Um, uh, and each of them in, in the first question that I ask will share a little bit of their background in terms of, of construction and mediation. We have a Rosemary uh, a Jackson QC. She, uh, uh, with apology, will be on, on, on video, right? Uh, Philip Brunner from the US is here with us live. So when he, he will also speak a little bit about his background when we do the first part. Uh, uh, Mr. Majid Singh. Uh, senior advocate was is supposed to be with us. I am not sure whether he has joined us as yet. And Sue Kim, a close friend of mine now, uh, from uh, two jurisdictions, UK and uh, 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 South Korea. And really quite exciting when she describes a little bit of her background and, and, and involvement with mediation, you'll find that uh, she comes with a very interesting background. All right. And uh, this is what we're going to be doing in our session I'll just make one quick introductory comment, and we will then tackle three questions. Uh, what, what is mediation to you and how long and what has, it, has your practice been in mediation, including virtual? Uh, and we'll go through each of the, the panelists. Second, we will do how do you see mediation applicable to the intri intricacies of construction industry practice? Three, the critical points uh, for construction industry practitioners in India in so far as mediation is concerned. Uh, concern, and I'll make a quick uh, 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 concluding uh, remarks, and then we can go into a Q and A. I think we would have sufficient time. So the dialogue would take us. I'm hoping to take us to about sixty minutes or so, and then we have thirty minutes of uh, for dialogue. All right. And so uh, this is this is the introductory comment I'd like to make. Very interestingly, your Chief Justice at an in Indo. Um, Singapore Mediation Summit on the 17th of July this year spoke about what conflict was. It's really quite unavoidable and stressed that conflict, there's always a need to develop 
a, a mechanism of conflict resolution, right? And he said that India and numerous Asian countries uh, have a long and rich collaborative and amicable settlement of disputes. So what you need to appreciate is this. We are in a very interesting world where uh, I have repeatedly said that it is no longer alternate dispute resolution. It is appropriate dispute resolution because you need to consider what is the most appropriate method of re resolving disputes. And in this session, we are going to focus primarily on mediation and how that works uh, in so far as the construction industry is concerned. But you have to take a quick point uh, to remember on and off that there are several uh, dispute resolution mechanisms in play and you have to weigh all of those uh, collectively, so to speak. All right. So now uh, the next point is, uh, is, is what the first question we have for this dialogue is what is mediation to you and how long and what has your practice in mediation, including uh, aspects of virtual, been like? What, is that, what has it been like? And we start. Uh, we wanted to start with Mr. Amajit Singh. I do not think he's here at the moment because I haven't been. Uh, oh, no, he had. He is here. I just got word that he is here. And could we have him share with us uh, what is mediation to him? How long has he been practicing there? Uh, and and uh, whether virtual is also an aspect that he's been dealing with. Uh, Mr. Singh, can we have him, sir? Sure, sure. Thank, Thank you, so you very much, much sir. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, mediation, so far as I am concerned, and so far as we in India, more particularly in Delhi, are concerned, we started when we brought an amendment to the, the Code of Civil Procedure by bringing amending Section 89 of the Code of Civil Procedure. And we brought mediation as par with conciliation, judicial settlement, etc. Then from 2006, really, the journey begins. And in 2006, we established a mediation center uh, with the God gave me that blessing and privilege that I was the president of the bar. And we started a mediation center. And that mediation center has developed over these years, both with respect to construction industry as well as with from we started from matrimonial and disputes with respect to family disputes we went up to commercial disputes today and all kinds of construction disputes especially after the pandemic has started we found that more people in the real estate business were facing more difficulties than we were facing earlier and we started looking at mediation as a process where we could resolve the disputes between stakeholders especially in respect to the construction industry and I'm proud to tell this August Gadian that in the last one and a half, two years that we have been having pandemic, only with respect to certain clauses, especially the force measure clause with respect to this industry, we have been able to resolve through mediation process. So we have to our credit the at least this construction industry alone, about 16, 17 matters, we are able to resolve these disputes. Now, mediation as a process, we actually go back in this country, right from the time when I have a mediation settlement. In fact, in Allahabad Museum, where Tulsi Dasji has signed a mediation settlement. It's his own hand, a mediation settlement. So it's not that this country is not aware of mediation. Yes, after the British came in, the I think the mediation took a little setback, I would call it. But then we brought it back into it. And I think the development by leaps and bounds is taken right from 2006. I find it going all over the country, right from, we have gone right up to as we as Madhyam, we have now gone right up to the Kanya Kumari from down, right up to Jammu and Kashmir, when we had a Chief Justice, Justice Gita Mittal, who gave us that privilege to give training to people, right up to people from Ladakh. So the privilege today is that mediation is a process, which process is empowering people, whether to factions of two litigants, two people who have disputes, who have conflicts. And we start this problem today the concept of mediation right from peers now we've gone up to schools now to tell people what mediation means and go to colleges to tell what conflicts can be how can be resolved we have brought a subject into a into the law today as part of a compulsory subject for teaching to the students but the mediation process has developed leaps and bounds as i said today we get about 68 to 70 matters in one center alone in delhi where we are able to resolve. And I'm also pleased to inform this August Guardian, most of the people today in mediation process till we brought this commercial mediation situation in 2016 have been doing it pro bono.
and i think that's the greatest success that we have been having in the construction industry we have now developed a new factor that we looked at especially with respect to our senior mediators where we thought that we could bring in an engineer or an architect as a co-mediator who understood the principles of mediation but his expertise will utilize as a mediation process to see how we can resolve the disputes more amicably timely and see what is the underlying idea and underlying interest of both the parties and that's where we started looking at mediation as a process well structured within that and now that we have now got i am um, also that media madhyam was part of the supreme court of india's committee which uh, made a recommendation with respect to that we should have in this country a mediation law in its own after especially the india signed singapore convention in 2019 and i'm happy to say that the model law or the framework of that law is in place we are today looking and debating what kind of fine tuning we can do the government is considering that am i happy that probably in the next few days maybe in the current session itself we have the mediation bill as a act soon or maybe in the next session which is the, after the winter session very much that 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 was incredible uh you know you you set the the, the tone for our discussion perfectly well I like the couple of points that you highlighted how you brought mediation in and 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 made it similar to conciliation and I, I believe that's part, partly because you have an arbitration and conciliation act uh and, that's right. and and many people may look at conciliation and not realize how uh mediation fits in right so uh, thank you for that point you also highlighted about 2006 when the mediation center started and and that kind of sets the framework where you want to head to and the fact that you mentioned peers and schools and education is something i'd like to discuss in 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 a, in our qa qa session but what you've just shown us and you're talking about the british and and, and where where culturally you have been uh, in my concluding remark i do have a comment about that 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 you know actually uh, is exactly what your chief minister said that if you think about uh, 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 asia and india the culture of mediation and dispute resolution has been entrenched in our system is just how we can empower the construction industry going forward to 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 uh take in what mediation can do for them and this panel is going to speak about that uh, uh quite a bit and it it's a great way to start thank you so much we will come back to you for the next uh two other questions in in the dialogue but uh, just brilliant thank you very much all right so uh, that, i just like to now have the the tech team upload rosemary's uh, uh uh video on on this first topic again what mediation is to her and what her practice has been and you know uh, including the point about virtual all right uh tech team over to you thank you very much for that greetings from london um, thank you very much for inviting me onto this panel i'm absolutely delighted to join you i'm really sorry i can't do it live because of time zone problems So thank you for asking me about my my mediation journey really I suppose. Um I I'm somebody who's quite surprised by being a mediator. All of my life I worked as a barrister and I thought the most exciting thing in the world was really to be fighting trials. It's it's such a buzz. You're pitting your wits against witnesses, against experts, against judges uh, and I truly thought it was the most exciting job going. Uh, and nobody's been more surprised than me really to discover that there's something i find even more exciting and that's mediation i've been a mediator now for 20 years and over the years i have worked um worked my way up to what's now a full-time practice so although um i'm still at chambers with all the other barristers i spend my time trying to put them out of work by settling their cases um which they tolerate i'm pleased to say and uh i i've now given up everything else i don't work as a barrister i don't appear in court i don't sit as a judge i don't sit as an arbitrator or an adjudicator i mediate because it's what i'm now passionate about i see the great results it has i would say in complex construction and engineering disputes it's it's probably successful in something around 65 70% of cases um more of them will settle perhaps after a mediation but I, i think those are very good odds so what sort of a mediator am i i see myself as the friend of the parties 
I want all of the parties to find the very best deal they can get on the day of the mediation. And I'm there to help them do it. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm being nice to them all the time. <laughs> uh, I will, in a friendly way, ask them difficult questions. I want them to search their own souls, to think about the risks they face, the advantages of finding a settlement early on. And uh, I, I, I try to run the process in the way that suits the parties best. I, I try to be facilitative, not evaluative. I think if you're being evaluative, um, it, it hobbles people. They're, they're not as open with you if they think you're going to be saying what you think the answer is at the end of the process. I prefer people to explore that themselves with my help. I may ask the sort of questions that are thought provoking. I may say, I've heard you explain this, but I still can't understand the point. How will you make the judge understand this? You know, what are the chances of it succeeding? And sometimes you can help people to recognize that they may have risks they didn't think they had before. So really doing that in any way we can and virtually in lockdown, for me, it's been fantastic. I thought it wouldn't be possible to mediate on a screen, but it turns out that it works really, really well. I mediate on Zoom if I can, and I can put everybody into separate rooms, just as I would if we were in a, a live mediation. And I have found it's very efficient. Uh, and there's very little loss of the things we thought were so important about being present in the space and the electricity of that moment. So I've been a very happy mediator in lockdown. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, those of you who are, who are watching us in this session, I'd like to, uh, you to think about these things, and we're going to speak about it in, 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 uh, in our uh, Q&A session. Uh, she kind of mentioned, uh, Rosemary said that she kind of puts people out of, uh, the other barristers out of work, but it's not necessarily the case. She said they tolerate, but I think, you know what, they really do appreciate uh, the kind of work that she does more than, more than anything else. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the Q&A. She also spoke about, you know, 60 to 70 percent of, of her work uh, in mediation gets settled. Uh, she said it's a friend of the party. She also highlighted this very critical point about being a facilitative mediator as opposed to an evaluative mediator. Some of our other panelists may speak a little bit about that. Uh, and so I want you to keep that all in mind and about the virtual uh, when she spoke about virtual, let me just share with you, just uh, earlier last week, I co-mediated a matter where the plaintiff was from uh, South America. So we started at 4.30 in the afternoon, and he was actually traveling from one city to another in between the mediation. We started at 4.30 p.m. We ended and settled the matter at, at 9 p.m. The party settled the matter at 9 p.m. Amazingly, he was in between that time flying from one city to another city, uh, and he was off the screen for about an hour, but no problem because we the parties had reached a certain stage and the lawyers were negotiating certain aspects and we engaged uh, parties uh, incredibly effectively. So you're talking about a South American country, the defendant was in Singapore. So think about that as well. Uh, we now move next to Philip, uh, a, a dear friend of mine, an incredible gentleman who works out uh, in, the, in the US uh, and he's gonna share a little bit about his experience with mediation. Over to you, sir. You know, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be uh, here with you. Uh, I've been fortunate over the years to uh, be involved in both uh, dispute resolution and litigation. Uh, for 40 years, I was a trial lawyer in the construction field. For the last 15 years, I've been the uh, director of the Global Engineering and, and Construction Group for JAMS, which is a uh, national and international uh, dispute resolution uh, firm that uh, offers mediation and arbitration and other types of ADR services. Uh, over the last 15 years, it's been a 100% either mediation or arbitration uh, with some neutral evaluation. And uh, these are all different ADR devices. Now, when uh, I began uh, practicing uh, in the early stages, mediation was just coming into its uh, common use in the United States. In the last uh, 60 years, you found an extensive increase in mediation uh, in the construction field. Uh, mediation does settle about 70% of uh, construction disputes. 
uh, there are about 90% of all U.S. cases get settled without going to court, which means certainly that there are other dispute resolution uh, procedures other than mediation that uh, make up the difference. But uh, uh, very widely, uh, mediation is uh, uh, very successfully used. And uh, I've been pleased to act as a construction mediator full time, uh, along with being a construction arbitrator. Now, having said that, uh, one of the uh, uh, things to be emphasized is that uh, uh, as a construction mediator, you see all types of cases, all kinds of approaches. Uh, certainly, uh, there is some difference of understanding regarding facilitative versus evaluative uh, mediation. And we will talk about that uh, a little later on the program, but it's enough to say that uh, Evaluated mediation does not mean giving a mediator's uh, final opinion, and uh, no mediator does that unless both parties ask for it and are agreed. But what it does mean by evaluated is being able to ask all the right questions rather than simply being a facilitated mediator, which means uh, going back and forth and saying, you've offered so much uh, uh and then get the other side to say, well, they'll drop their demand and just uh, going back and forth, facilitating discussions. That's a little different than the kind of evaluated mediation that we see uh, in the construction field, which through appropriate questions gets the parties thinking about uh, just how solid their claims are. But with that, why well, thank you, Anil. So, you know, uh, again, to the audience who are, who are attending this session, uh, you see a gentleman who's been in it for 40 years, right? And he has, for the last 15 years or so, been dealing with uh, extensively with the global engineering construction uh, uh, part of, of JAM. So you can see where the focus is. It is with construction. And you're, see, you're seeing a gentleman that doesn't have to go to court and litigate. You're seeing a, a, an experience and exposure of, of, of having your matters dealt with in mediation and arbitration and when he spoke about mediation he spoke about this thing about facilitative and evaluative mediation now many of you may not know what it is we'll talk about it a little bit in in, in our uh, in our discussion in a dialogue and maybe in the q a uh, if we have the time we can take on a little bit more but it is interesting to note that you, even if you're doing an evaluative mediation where 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 the, the mediator has to impart some experience that he has he deals with it in a way of asking the right form type of questions. And that's an, a very important aspect. And especially so, I think, in construction industry. And that's why Philip is highlighting the point that you may not be able to just facilitate a mediation if it's a highly complex construction matter. You might want to get to a stage where it's slightly evaluative by asking the right questions. And when you ask the right questions, people pop up and say, yes, actually, you were right. I was thinking about that. And then eventually you still get to the end result of parties coming to a conclusion that they are comfortable with. So we'll take this forward as well. Thank you very much, Philip. Next, we have Sue. Uh, and this is going to be interesting, very interesting uh, for, for many of you um, uh, non-lawyer pra uh, practitioners. And i just like Sue to share where she's been and what she does and, 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 and uh, how it relates to construction. Over to you, Sue. Thank you very much, Anil. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Sue Kim. Thank you very much for inviting me today. It's my absolute pleasure to present today. I'm a Chartered Quantity Surveyor by background, a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and non-practicing barrister based in London. I work mainly as a quantum expert, in construction dispute, in mediation, litigation, adjudication, and arbitration. I have over 20 years experience. I've been involved in mediation, representing the parties and as an expert witness. Instead of talking any more about myself today, I think it would be more helpful to you if I briefly provide an overview of mediation in the UK and South Korea. So where are we now in the UK and South Korea? Firstly, the UK. In the UK, mediation is currently a voluntary process and there's no statutory mediation. But there's been judicial support 
for encouraging the use of ADR. For example, the courts have powers to stay proceedings to allow mediation to take place, but such a stay does not force the parties to go beyond considering mediation. The courts can also penalize a party in cost for any unreasonable refusal to mediate. For example, in the case of NGM and BAE, the judge concluded that BAE's reasonable belief that he had a strong defense was not in itself enough to make the rejection of mediation reasonable. So pa the parties must engage with a serious invitation to participate in ADR. And also there's been a recent movement towards mandatory ADR, including mediation. Uh, for example, this year, the Ministry of Justice initiated the call for evidence, which is requesting industry bodies, including the CR, the Bar Council, the Academy of Experts, to provide their experience and evidence of ADR. And in June 2021, the Civil Justice Council published a report recommending compulsory ADR, including mediation. So though the UK is not a signatory to the to the Singapore Convention on Mediation as yet for the resolution of cross-border commercial disputes, the, the convention, I think the convention may still apply to the UK parties because of its wider scope. Now let's consider South Korea. South Korea has a Mediation Act and other legislation. The courts encourage mediation in relation to commercial disputes and recommend court next mediation either before or during court proceedings. And mediation has been used, but not as widely as arbitration or litigation. I think mainly because of lack of knowledge regarding mediation as to how to use it. When the parties opt for mediation, the vast majority of cases are conducted by the court and there are very few private uh, mediations. And unlike the UK, there are no cost of sanctions against a party who refused to mediate. And similar to India, South Korea is one of the signatories to the Singapore Convention on Mediation, but this convention has yet to be incorporated into national law. Thank you. Over to Anil. So, so again, uh, to those of you who, are, who have joined us for this session, I, I hope you see the angle where Sue comes from, a couple of point, interesting points. Her background, chartered surveyor, uh, quantum expert, non-practicing barrister, uh, and, and and she highlighted the difference in, in, in UK and, and South Korea. So you'll see that, that, that it seems that in the UK as well, it seems a lot more entrenched than it is in South Korea because South Korea is trying to appreciate what mediation is about. So it's something that, that India wants to take away as well. Uh, uh, thinking about how how mediation is and where it's headed to. All right, so we'll discuss a little bit more about that. We come last to me on this session, uh, and I thought it's, it is just important for me to just highlight. I've been in practice for 25 years. I call myself, or I don't, don't address myself as a lawyer per se, but I say conflict avoidance, dispute resolution, restorative justice, and online dispute resolution practitioner. Uh, uh, accredited as a mediator and arbitrator, as, as many of the rest of the panelists here are. And it makes a difference. It's important because especially when you talk about mediation, that accreditation and being accredited in the mediation makes you appreciate a lot more what facilitative, um, uh, evaluative mediation is about, how you tackle the people. So just going out there and calling yourself a mediator, not trained for it, may cause some problems. You may want to think about that, right? Now, in Singapore, it's been a very essential part of media. Uh, mediation has been a, a, an essential part. Um, for example, uh, ever since I started practice um, um, uh, in the state court of Singapore, which is less than 250,000 US dollars, um, almost all commercial matters go to mediation first. And of that, maybe about 80% gets resolved uh, uh, at mediation. All right. So it is entrenched. It's been there for a long time. Of course, the Singapore Convention that's come in place uh, gives it a, a, a level of enforceability. Now, on that point, I just wanted to highlight something, that because we are entrenched in the mediation system, uh, mm -hmm. I thought that the Singapore Convention was weird. To me, it, was, it sounded weird because why do I need a convention to enforce mediation when parties have amicably settled 
uh, at their level of comfort. They, 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 they have settled it. It's not imposed by any third party. And if they have settled, why would they then uh, default on it? Then I realized that in some cultures around the world, people turn to mediation as an, a, a method of avoiding going to court and ultimately they don't want to fulfill that requirement and they stall matters. So for those countries that have that kind of a culture in place, um, the, the Singapore Convention might be really helpful. So my last point on, on this question is that you really need to appreciate uh, uh, consensual dispute resolution, which includes conciliation, mediation, negotiations, and adjudicative me method of dispute resolution that includes arbitration, adjudication, neutral evaluation, expert determination, uh, dispute boards, and so on. So you have to have this whole idea because several lawyers in practice uh, around the world, that whenever I speak to them and, and, and they ask me what I do, I do dispute resolution. And they go, what's that? Then when I talk about uh, ADR, obviously many people think of it as alternate dispute resolution, but I have for about eight, nine years now said it's appropriate dispute resolution. And when I describe that, they all tend to say, what's that? What do you mean? So having a fundamental appreciation of what appropriate dispute resolution is and what it can do, it is really, really quite important. So if you want to embark on this journey down the path of being a mediator, you have to keep this in mind that you need to appreciate what it is. You need to understand what a dispute resolution is and, and all of that. All right. Now, with that, we go on to the next question. The next question here we have is this. How do you see mediation applicable to the intricacies of construction practice? All right, because that's what we are here for. All right, uh, and, and we'll start off uh, with Philip on that. Philip, over to you, sir. Thank you, Neil. There are seven key reasons for uh, mediation of construction disputes. The first, of course, is the party's maintenance of control. In virtually every mediation I go into, I advise the parties right up front that uh, the mediation could be the last time in which the parties themselves have the control to resolve the dispute. If the mediation fails for some reason and you go on to arbitration or you go into litigation, you're turning the whole dispute over to third parties to decide for you. And so there's a need to understand very clearly that mediation gives the parties the greatest opportunity with their great knowledge about what the dispute is to resolve it. And of course, it is also confidential now, uh, arbitration can be confidential, other forms of dispute resolution. Uh, litigation certainly is not. If you're in court, why, unless there's a court order uh, limiting disclosure of uh, the facts presented, uh, it's public knowledge. Now, what is it about construction that uh, uh, makes mediation and, fr frankly, alternative dispute resolution so important? And that is the technological and legal complexity of the field. And you can say, well, what's technologically complex about construction? Well, only those people who aren't fully appraised of uh, how the construction process works uh, would ask that question. But let me begin by saying that construction comprises a host of applied sciences. You have architecture, you have engineering, such as civil engineering, soils, structural, electrical, mechanical, and others. You have uh, material sciences governing the extraction, formulation, and manufacture of building materials. You have principles of construction uh, management and the construction process itself that address the practical building process. You also have a complexity that's created by the uniqueness of virtually every project. Construction is one of the few fields where you don't have machines stamping out uh, project after project that looks the same. Uh, you have most projects are unique, built to a unique design on a unique site by a unique aggregation of companies operating without economies of scale in an uncontrolled environment where productivity is affected by weather, geology, local labor skills and availability, local building materials, and site accessibility. In other words, every project, every major project is going to be complex. Every major project is going to be entirely different than any other, uh, except in the, the sense that you have uh, the same 
scientific principles and uh, that are going to apply to it. Now, when you get into the complexity of construction, uh, the, con the context of construction itself has created a, the law to be recognized as really a separate breed of animal. And I'll be talking a little bit about that later. When you look at construction overall, you have to ask yourself, well, would a judge in this jurisdiction know more about uh, construction than an arbitrator or mediator who's had significant practice in the field? Uh, the answer is that there are many judges who came out of uh, uh, prosecutorial or criminal work who don't understand much about construction. And so having parties that could really help the parties uh, or, or having mediators who can really help the parties understand fully the consequences of their various actions through proper questioning uh, can help significantly. And so uh, you go on and then talk about uh, uh, another aspect of mediation is that because you have the parties talking between and among themselves, they are not shouting at each, at each other from the either other ends of courtrooms, but uh, by uh, uh, being able to uh, conduct discussions, negotiations in a principled uh, civil manner uh, is sure to maintain business relationships. Uh, if parties can get through a dispute uh, without shouting at each other and uh, uh, you know getting angry with each other, as often happens in court, uh, that is uh, a critical plus for the process. You also have the question of minimizing expense. Uh, many people, of course, well, in the United States, where we have many clauses, uh, the American Institute of Architects, for example, requires mediation. Uh, as a condition to any mediation or litigation. And so uh, uh, they recognize that if parties can talk early and get uh, matters resolved before spending all the time preparing for trial and going into court and then the costs of appeal, uh, mediation will really serve to uh, save expenses much quicker. And of course, you have the whole issue of whether your court dockets will even permit a uh, resolution of a dispute within uh, a matter of uh, six months or a year. I mean, is he going to be pushed out into five years, 10 years, whatever the, the, the court uh, docket arrangement is? And I know that in some countries, uh, courts have uh, much more difficulty uh, getting cases to trial and getting things resolved. Uh, when you have the talk about the unsuitability of litigation, I want to just take a brief minute to read a comment which I think illustrates the difficulties that many judges do have in dealing with the complexities of construction, and you need to bear that in mind. This was a federal judge who was addressing the parties before him in a pretrial conference, and it appears in the judge's decision the parties obviously didn't take his advice, and uh, but he wanted to make sure in the final decision that uh, he laid out why the parties should have proceeded with uh, uh, resolving the matter themselves through mediation. And the, the judge said, being trained in this field of construction, you are in a far better position to adjust your differences than those untrained in its related fields. As an illustration, I, who have no training whatsoever in engineering, have to determine whether or not the emergency generator, generator system proposed to be furnished met the specifications when experts couldn't agree. This is a strange bit of logic. The object of litigation is to do substantial justice between the parties litigant but the parties litigant should realize that in most situations, they are by their particular training better able to accomplish this among themselves. And so with the help of a mediator, uh, parties can get together and resolve things among themselves because they know more about their disputes, know more about the issues relating to their disputes than uh, anybody else. 
And so you finally get down to another issue as to if you go through mediation and don't settle, is that the end of it? Well, not necessarily. The parties can agree on a road forward. Typically in the mediation process, there are issues that do come up that uh, one party or the other says, or maybe it's their insurance companies who say, well, gee, I hadn't considered that. I'm going to have to do some further thinking about that, maybe get an expert to help advise it and so on. Well, uh, stuff happens that uh, parties uh, may not have been fully apprised of and need a little additional time. And so there can be a road to settlement that developed out of the mediation itself. The mediators can follow up. Mediation is a process. It is not simply uh, an end to uh, negotiation. And certainly there are other uh, ADR methods that can be brought in like neutral evaluation, expert determination, adjudication, uh, structured negotiations between senior management, a variety of different ADR devices. But uh, through mediation, principally, were the days when parties would say, well, I've been to mediation and ADR is right. It's another day ruined. They no longer say that. Far more, they say ADR means another dispute resolved. Thank you, Anil. So you see what, what, what is critical about what Philip spoke about is that why would you want to consider mediation for, for the construction industry? And he highlighted some very essential points. The highly technical aspects of construction and the parties that are involved in that. Uh, the fact that, you know, you really want to keep your business relationship going. The fact that the judges, you know, the, the case that he cited gives you a perfect example. How is a, a, a judge supposed to make a decision when the own experts on board can't get it right? Right. So why why do you want to go down the path of, of having to deal with your cons, uh, dispute in a manner that you leave it, take it away from your hands into a third party's hands? And mediation allows you to have power over it, control over it and make the decisions that you will really put you guys back in a, in, a, in a place where you need to be. And the place that you need to be in the construction industry is carrying on with the work, uh, delivering on time and doing everything else that's necessary to, to, to bring about uh, you know, the, the, the infrastructure and, and, and the buildings up and running. And to do that, you really don't want to go down the path of, of disputes and, and having some third party resolve that. And then this is what just Philip de described in, in detail. So you find, that while some of the other industries may not think that mediation is, is the best way to go in, in respect of the uh, uh, industry, you'd find that in, in construction industry, it becomes so very important. And let's hear from several of the others as well from the panel. Over to Sue, pl please. Thank you, Anir. So in my opinion, um, mediation is definitely, definitely suitable for the construction industry and it should be used more often. Most types of construction disputes are potentially suitable for mediation, but, but mediation may not be appropriate in all cases. For example, claims for injunctive relief, an issue of law which requires the court ruling, or in my experience, disputes arising from projects where the conduct of one or both parties has been hostile throughout the project and not willing to compromise which made a mediator settlement impossible and caused the mediation to be a waste of time and money. But let's look at the benefit of benefits of mediation. I feel just to mention the a couple of benefits of mediation. In, that, in addition to that, um, I'd like to say mediation has a number of benefits, some of which I've listed here in the slide. Firstly, mediation saves cost, time and relationships. As you know, mediation is a process where a neutral third party, mediate, the mediator, helps the parties to amicably resolve disputes. So the parties seek to find a common ground and work towards an amicable solution. This can be compared with other forms of dispute resolution available to the parties, including adjudication, arbitration, or court proceedings, where the process is, is adversarial and each party just attempts to blame the other. And both arbitration and litigation have been recognized as costly options and often used by party with a deeper pocket. Secondly, it has high success rates. According to 
a survey from CEDA, which is the Center for Effective Dispute, Dispute Resolution, a couple of years ago, 89% of commercial mediations had in the UK settled. Thirdly, mediations, mediation reduced the backlog of cases before the court. Fourthly, mediation provides a wider range of confidential solutions than those available in litigation, arbitration, adjudication. adjudication. So in mediation, the outcome could be an apology or explanation or to carry out work or omit work, regardless of whether there is a legal obligation to do so, or to provide additional services or additional goods, or to continue a business relationship. Lastly, the parties have control over strategy, procedure, and outcome, rather than handing over to a third party to decide. I mean, nobody is forcing anyone to settle here or to accept any particular terms. That's that's actually up to the parties. Even if the disputes are not settled on the day, mediation allows the parties to take a realistic view of their cases and seed for settlement and so on. So mediation can take place at any time and is relatively inexpensive and quick. So in my opinion, mediation should always be considered as part of the strategy for resolving a construction dispute and as the first form of dispute resolution before adjudication, arbitration or court proceedings are commenced. In the UK at least, as I mentioned earlier, an offer to mediate can provide some cost protection if it's rejected unreasonably and if the matter later goes to litigation or arbitration. Thank you, Anil. You see again, uh, uh, her experience now, what she just shared is what's, what's happening in UK. And you find the sense and sensibility of, of, of wanting to, do, to resolve the matter, a complex construction matter by way of, of uh, uh, mediation. So, you know, some of the, these points are relevant. Some of these points you may not think, uh, or some of you may think that it's, yeah, it's, you know, we know that and all of that. But, you know, when you get into a dispute in a construction matter, when you think about the complexities of it that, that Philip had described, and pair that with what, what Sue is now saying, you realize, hang on, that must be my first port of call. It surely must be the first avenue I want to take. Uh, you may think that you need some expert uh, uh, advice on it uh, beforehand. That's fine. Do that. But then you want to go down the path and say, I think this is where it should be. Medi mediation should be the way going forward in construction matters. So thank you, Sue, for that. Uh, we have Singh back to you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we have had taken a little bit of a look uh, from foreign countries, and now we, we bring you back to, to, to India, where, where it's really about what we want to do. Right, sir? Over to you, sir. I first wanted to bring home to all my participants and my panelists that in India, really speaking, land by and large, after especially it is acquired, it is acquired by the government, whether it's the state government or the central government. And thereafter, we have now developed a concept of private-public partnership where right of residence, for example, is to be determined. And the endeavor of every government is to ensure that residence is provided to people at a cheaper price, so an affordable situation. So really speaking, you have three people who are working on, one who has got the allotment, the other who started building as contractors. The third is the government which now acquires land. So many times there's a multi-party disputes that we have come across in mediation process. And that multi-party is whether the government has not been able to acquire and produce the land at the disposal, especially with respect to national highways, etc., where we find acquisition becomes a problem and people go to court, get a matter of state. Therefore, the problem is the construction stops. Now, in this process, mediation is considered to be the best process available because you are able to bring factions together on the table. They know the best what can be done. And in one of the matters, I'm proud to say that we were able to resolve a matter with respect to a construction of a national highway. In relation to the government agreed that to the persons whose land was being acquired would be given a better compensation outside the courts. So for a mediation settlement between the government and the landowner came in to the, to the place before the court in a different proceeding. 
rather than a, a mediation settlement amongst the two people who were the land owning agency ultimately or who at whose disposal the land was placed that the state government as well as with respect to the contractor or the builder therefore the best mechanism that we have found and after i said priorly that after the commercial division 2016 commercial courts act we have found 69 to 70 percent matters getting resolved construction is no exception to me and in india we found recently after especially the pandemic has gone come in we find that the people were not able to reach out to the timelines that they had agreed to give to the builder to the people who had booked their flats or their apartments or their business ventures to the apartment therefore mediation became a best process to see how those timelines can be brought back because as i think mr phillips rightly said we rightly said that people know the best it is just that they have to be brought back to table to understand each other's points empower them to see how best they can resolve the matter in circumstances and the experience shows that adjudication even with respect to arbitration is take longer time it is more expensive it is time consuming and the sufferer is somebody who has actually sought allotment of that property whether it's a flat or it's a business apartment or the industry for example we have seen steel industry going down the drain at one point of time because obviously to construct a steel industry multifaceted people were to come back together and they we found disputes between people who were making civil work and people who were doing engineering work people who were trying plant and machinery so when you have multi-purpose disputes coming up before mediator he helps you in his wisdom help takes the help of an expert parties know their best empowers them to still build back the relationship and i think the greatest factor that the mediation has played in india especially is to how do you build back the relationship and when you build back the relationship you actually achieve the constitutional norm to bring justice to people which we call a social justice therefore but the, in india we have a, a cultural problem not really a problem i would say that culture in north is distinct from south is distinct from east and west Therefore, everybody, a mediator who may be very good in a particular field in the north, will have to look at the cultural things in the south to bring home that thing. Therefore, apart from knowing mediation as a structured process, and we at Madhyam being able to bring that out to see how we bring the cultural differences together, how we built up all this to and empower the parties to ensure what is their actual mode that they actually need to look at and achieve that goal by virtue of the empowering them. And I think Phillips rightly said, there is a distinction that we have so far in India, we have only done facilitative. We have not really talked of evaluated mediation, but in a form that I think he gave a very good example, when you put a question to a one of the parties, you're not actually giving a decision. You're telling him an example with respect to something else which has happened in another case. And maybe he takes a hint and empowers himself to come to a similar decision in the circumstances of that case. So therefore, to that extent, evaluating, unlike conciliation, where a conciliator puts in his suggestion with respect to a concrete plan, we in mediation, we have not done it. And after Uncentral Law 2018 have been amended, I think we have to have to make that distinction between conciliation and mediation in India. We have made it. Because we have now said everywhere, wherever the consultation is, the bill says would be substituted by the word mediation. So the, after the Singapore con Convention have been signed, so we are looking for its implementation, as I think we said with respect to Korea, that we are looking at that implementation. We are expecting that the mediation will take place and probably will implement that. But we are not confining ourselves to commercial disputes which are there in the Singapore Convention. We are looking at every dispute and the endeavor is every dispute before every tribal panchayat or even at the level of Tuglag or the level of village must go to mediator first and if mediation fails then knock the core of the door whether you want to go to adjudicatory in arbitration whether you want to go to court because the india looking at the problem that we are facing looking at the complexity of the things and economic position that we are looking at where are complex issues that have arisen and i think the best mode forward the best way forward to achieve that economic end ultimately for the country is that we all as lawyers, we all as practitioners, we all as people who believe in bringing harmony and peace into society for the end result for the economic upliftment of the India 
is mediation and therefore mediation must be adopted and in india fortunately for us courts have been very proactive the honorable supreme court itself has uh, sent many matters to us with respect to pending matters in the supreme court and i am very happy that it all post all parts of the country mediation is taking place we have now chambers of commerce of all over the country coming back to us to saying we want to establish mediations we want mediators to be on our panel and i'm sure we will be able to achieve that goal and probably india would be one of the hubs for mediation in times to come the one is accredited to simi and one is accredited to siac but still at the same time what you do for your country this is also a giver i take it that a mediator gives is help to ensure harmony and relationship building and i think that also should have the blessings as we believe in india by all gods whom whomsoever we may bring in whether it's hindu christian sikh or isai that we all are moving towards one direction how do we bring more peace into the country how do we bring harmony in the country and if we have achieved that right from the type and therefore mediation ultimately in india would become a way of life as that's how we understand much sir i think what, what is really uh, important is that you you brought brought us back down to what india needs and what it's facing and you talked about this fact that you know if you look at the kind of projects that are going on the ppp and and, and affordable housing and that it's multi party and then you want to really bring the factions together and and you want to be able to deliver those 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 houses to the people who need them and the best way to resolve any of those issues is by mediation so you know you you brought it back to its essence and i think i also like the point about this peace uh, you know it's really about peace building at the end of the day and if you want to uh, build peace and you want to deliver on all of the items that you need to deliver at the end of the day especially in construction matters the best approach that you want to take is down the path of mediation and and the structure seems to be in place you and your organizations have, have, have put that in place and people are engaging you'd find people a lot more people coming down to 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 see whether they can get their matters uh, mediated now rosemary mentioned one quick thing about you know taking away from barristers but what i do is this i tell people if i can turn around a matter in mediation in 2 months i can take on the next matter and the next matter wouldn't that be far better than sitting on one particular matter for the next one and a half years in in court or in arbitration and at the end of the day the client is going to be left having the decision made by a third party and it doesn't really sit too well in the amount of money he spent but whereas if i clear two uh, uh, one mediation in a, in a matter of two months i keep moving and in, in, in that same period of time i would have helped a whole lot more people than just the ones that are going to arbitration or court so something to really think about take a step back uh, uh, you know like i said i'm a practitioner for about 25 years but i've learned that there is more and there's a lot more peace building that needs to be done and that's the best way to do that is through mediation as well so thank you very much for that uh we go to uh, uh rosemary here now and her next uh, video clip please thank you well my view would be that mediation isn't just applicable to intricate construction and engineering project disputes but vital to them uh, experience shows that a complicated construction or engineering dispute takes years to resolve and during that time the people who are involved in the project instead of getting on with their next project are spending all of their time feeding information to the lawyers to keep the process going it's very very expensive because it's so technical there are lots of experts needed and um of course there's risk in everything and the the benefits of getting everything resolved being able to draw a line under the dispute take away all the risk and move on to the next project are huge is it suitable yes of course it's suitable um but that in my mind is because you can build the process around the dispute and the needs of the parties sometimes people have a very complex dispute but the people who are going to make the decisions just want to shake hands on a deal they just want to find a bottom line number other times you can put together a whole process and sometimes i i project manage mediations so that there are whole processes of experts meetings perhaps with me in advance of the mediation there are decisions uh, decision makers who might have to have some preliminary conversations maybe some commercial discussions that will narrow the issues and then we can put together a process 
where the parties look at the intricacies in as much detail as they need to. They don't necessarily need to do it, but insofar as they do, we can put that together. And uh, when the mediation itself arrives, they have hopefully narrowed down the things that it will help for them to talk about. Of course, there are lots of issues. There's never time to talk about everything, but I encourage parties to think of the things that will unlock their dispute. No point having long discussions in workshops uh, about an issue where you simply won't change each other's minds and you know exactly what each other thinks. That's just a waste of time. Much better to find the things, perhaps some points of principle that lie behind the numbers that you can talk about uh, and explore with each other. And that may help you to assess risk. Uh, and once you've assessed the risk on the point of principle, then you can feed numbers in and see where you want to go with it. So yes, because of the flexibility of the process, I think it's highly appropriate to these sorts of disputes. All right. Thank you, Rosemary. So the, again, uh, Rosemary has taken us back to the point about uh, technical details, the intricacies of, of construction matter, uh, the risk involved in having a third party make the decision as opposed to you controlling it. So you see in a construction matter, it becomes critical. She talks about the process of, of getting it mediated as opposed to going to court and in arbitration. And she spoke about the bottom line at the end of the day. At the end of the day, the parties want to, in a construction matter, to get on and complete the work and move along, get on to the next project, have your money cash flow moving and, and so on and so forth. So really, you know, if you think about it, take a step back and say, oh my God, why am I going down the path of arbitration and, and, and uh, uh, litigation when I can sit down and have it mediated by expert mediators, people who are really trained and appreciate how to analyze and consider the parties. I mean, the expertise, let me just quickly share, or uh, maybe I'll just come to my, my part first and then we can we can share a little bit more uh, if, uh, if time permits, right? So I wanted to say uh, uh, on the same topic, right? It's really the complexities can well be be, be dissected if you go down to, to uh, into elements, right? So I've had a matter where it was in court, uh, 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 in arbitrary, uh, well, in trial, a construction matter, and there was a, part where the courts were going to take a step back, uh, uh, stop for about a month or so. And then the judge su suggested to the to the parties, you know, you have a Scott schedule here and there are so many of these elements. There are 70 items on it. On this 30 items, I think you may want to go down the path of going to see a mediator, an expert who's in that field and see whether you can get some guidance. So it came to me and my boss my, when I was in-house at that point in time. And we mediated uh, the matter, the various aspects and got it settled and got it off the table. Right? And when they went back to court, they were down from 70 items on the Scott schedule right down to about 20 or 30. So you see what, what difference it can make. Right? Uh, parties who, who choose, say, say, for example, you go down the path of mutual evaluation, expert determination or whatever, you can choose not to have it binding on the parties. And then you can go back to the mediation table and using this neutral evaluation or expert determination, use that as a guide to make a decision for yourself. So you see, you can use and engage with the other dispute resolution mechanisms and tell, use that. I need a neutral evaluator. I need an expert uh, uh, opinion on this matter. Bring it to the table, mediate and settle, right? So again, the next point was this technicalities of the construction project. All of our speakers have spoken uh, to some extent on it. Um, and you, the final point I wanted to say is that you really have to appreciate it's a far, far shorter method of dispute resolution, right? Uh, as opposed to one that takes so long that it has a third party making a decision when you should be trying to resolve it yourself. So you see how helpful and effective it is if you take mediation uh, to the construction matters, all right? So this is the second one. The third one is that we come to the last part of our, our discussion here. Uh, the critical points for the construction industry, which many of you are in, practitioners uh, in India, we'd like our panel to share uh, their, their quick views on this, right? And we start here with uh, Kim, uh, Sue Kim. Sue. Thank you, Anil. Thank you, Anil. A brief uh, critical point, firstly, from the party's perspective, learning more about mediation and indeed about all forms of dispute resolution is really important. And as Anil mentioned earlier, we have to weigh up all the dispute resolution options collectively. In terms of mediation, 
learn about the best time to consider mediation. The parties can agree to mediate at any time, even if adjudication, arbitration, or court proceedings have commenced. The optimum time for mediation to be successful really depends on what and how much information the parties require before they can sensibly weigh up the strengths and weaknesses of their positions and attempt a negotiated settlement. But I think the right time for mediation is really um, usually as early as possible before lots of money has been spent. Because the earlier mediation takes place in the proceedings, the more cost the parties will save in the preparation of a court or arbitration hearing, and the more chances they can have to settle. Secondly, learn to be patient in mediation. In practice, mediation, like a cricket test match, can be a slow game and requires patience. Thirdly, remember that a mediator is not a judge or an arbitrator which parties often get confused. The the mediator is not there to make a judgment on the dispute, so will not require exhaustive documentation. The mediator simply needs to know enough about the dispute in order to assist the parties in reaching a settlement. Now let's consider a brief couple of points from um, an expert perspective. Firstly, giving clear instructions should go without saying. If you're not clear, the expert will not know what you want. You might even end up with a fantastic expert report about the wrong issues. Secondly, both the expert and the parties appointing them should clearly understand the role and duties of the expert, including whether the expert is appointed as expert advisor or independent expert witness. If an expert is appointed as an independent expert witness in mediation and continue to be involved in proceedings going forward if no settlement is achieved in mediation, the independent expert witness should remain independent and impartial at all stages of mediation. For example, during mediation, the experts and part the parties appointing them need to need to ensure that the experts do not say or do anything in mediation that compromises the expert independence or impartiality in the subsequent proceedings. And also, it may be sensible for the experts not to attend any private meetings with the parties and their representatives to preserve the experts' independence. And if the experts are instructed to attend joint expert meetings and to produce a joint statement, the experts should avoid straying into advocacy or negotiation because it's not the role of the expert witness in mediation to seek seek compromise. That's the job of the party representative. Thirdly, confidentiality. The experts should remember their duty to maintain confidentiality. If the mediation does not result in a settlement, then all documents provided and all written or oral communications in the mediations are strictly without prejudice and cannot be disclosed or referred to in subsequent proceedings. It is also important to ensure that if the experts are instructed to engage with the other parties representative, they avoid disclosing confidential information or documentations are less expressly authorized to do so. So these are my brief thoughts of mediation. I've had the limited time to talk about really big topics. I hope what I've said makes sense and hope you find it helpful. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sue. We'll, we'll, we'll take the rest in, in, in Q&A. We want to try and see whether we can slot a little bit of time for that. I move now on to Philip. And Neil, you asked me to discuss uh, critical points for the construction industry practitioners in India, and I would like to begin with the advice given to the legal profession in the United States back in 1985 by our U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren E. Berger. Uh, This was at a time when the courts were beginning uh, full-fledged support for uh, alternate dispute resolution, and 
What Ber Berger, Justice, Chief Justice Berger said was this, the obligation of the legal profession is or has long been thought to be to serve as healers of human conflicts. To fulfill that traditional obligation means that there should be mechanisms that can produce an acceptable result in the shortest possible time with the least possible expense and with a minimum of stress on the participants. That is what justice is all about. And he went on to say, my overview of the work of the courts from a dozen years on the Court of Appeals, that is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, where he was a judge, and now 16 years in my present position as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, added to 20 years of private law practice, has given me some new perspectives. One thing an appellate judge learns very quickly is that a large part of all litigation in the courts is an exercise in futility and frustration. A large proportion of civil disputes in the courts could be disposed of more satisfactorily in some other way. And one of those ways clearly is mediation. For all the reasons that you've heard during our discussions uh, here uh, on this session, well, you can understand fully why uh, mediation is so helpful. And let me touch on a couple of other critical points. Uh, when you get to talking about the role of the mediator, uh, clearly the role of the mediator uh, ought to be to help the parties each understand their risks in proceeding. And in order to do that, the mediator, uh, him or herself, has to be knowledgeable about both the factual and legal issues involved. Uh, certainly, uh, having that background is vitally important in, in acting as a mediator. Now, the first thing that I do in mediations is to ask the parties to lay out fully in separate briefs just what their disputes are all about, both as a matter of fact and law, and ask the parties to be uh, fully candid on it. If there's a need for some uh, exchange of documents, uh, that can be worked out very clearly. To do this earlier than later is important because if you do it too late, by, by that time, uh, uh, typically the, the lawyers have uh, expressed their views that they think their position is great and they've got all of the issues tied down and uh, the clients think that they might as well go roll the dice in court. Uh, uh, certainly there are many parties who, if they've really thought about it, would want to resolve things earlier, and certainly at least when they know all the facts. So uh, th there is an effort to get the facts out on the table, both the, the uh, uh, facts of the dispute itself and the legal uh, issues. And the legal issues are important. And I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, construction law today is being viewed uh, certainly in the United States, and I believe elsewhere, is a separate breed of animal. It's not just contract law. As we know, where there's uh, uh, many non-contract kinds of claims uh, that come into play now. There are statutory claims that come into play. There, uh, uh, Even where the, you have so-called contract disputes, uh, you have many legal issues regarding the uh, uh, interpretation of contracts and the uh, addition in the contracts of implied obligations. Certainly in civil law jurisdictions, you have uh, the good uh, uh, implied duty of good faith and fair dealing. But uh, even in common law jurisdictions, you have many implied obligations, including good faith and fair dealing. Uh, the implied warranty of uh, design adequacy that uh, owners usually give the implied warranties of uh, uh, cooperation on the part of both parties, uh, the uh, contractor's implied duty of good workmanship. You've got a whole host of uh, terms and conditions that have, are being read into construction contracts as a matter of law. So when you say, well, this is just a matter of reading the contract, well, you're very mistaken because 
Uh, there are a lot of terms and conditions that don't appear in the contract itself that courts are construing in the contracts now. And beyond that, you've got uh, your uh, equitable principles governing a whole host of construction issues like indemnification rights and uh, quantum merit recoveries. And you have specialized damage concepts that are unique to construction also that parties need to be aware of, such as the doctrines of substantial performance. Uh, in the United States, for example, and in many common law jurisdictions, if the contract has been substantially performed, the contractor may not be terminated for default. And the owner's remedies are uh, uh, when recoveries are significantly different if there has been some achievement of substantial performance. You also have the damage doctrine of economic waste, of betterment, of total costs versus other forms of recovery or damage measurements. And in short, uh, it, it is critical to uh, be able to uh, work with a mediator who can uh, help the parties understand and appraise their various risks. And sometimes uh, risk assessment is a mediation tool that's used. You know, asking parties separately to appraise their risks. You know, if, uh, if one party says improper notice or no notice was given of the claim and the contract required notice, well, you can uh, ask the parties, well, what do you think the, the risk is that uh, you might not prevail on that, given the fact that uh, different courts appraise risk differently. You have a number of different approaches. And so I can only say that critical points are, you necessarily should help parties resolve disputes early. You have uh, a need for understanding fully the legal implications as well as the factual implications. And uh, mediators can help with that. Thank you very much. quickly as well, uh, add, add a couple of quick points. You really have to have a clear appreciation. We're talking about mediation and construction industry. So you really need to have a clear appreciation of what mediation essentially means. Uh, this fact about it being consensual as opposed to adjudicative, which is what the other methods many of us spoke about, uh, expert determination, neutral evaluation, dispute boards are all adjudicative because a third party then decides. We have this thing about facilitative and evaluative. Uh, uh, we've also spoke extensively about that. So as mediators in the construction industries, please consider these points. Uh, a desire to want to be in control of the decision, finally, we spoke about that extensively as well. And so you know that you know if I go down the path of arbitration or I go down the path of going to court, I would not have that uh, advantage. Appreciate the full extent of, of what uh, appropriate dispute resolution mechanism is. And it's, it's something that I, I've repeatedly used what Abraham Lincoln said, discourage litigation, uh, peace, uh, you know, persuade uh, your neighbors to compromise uh, uh, whenever you can. Point out that uh, them how uh, the nominal winner is often the real uh, loser uh, in fees and so on. So really, you've got to go down the path of thinking about as peacemakers, what can we do? As, as we're not just litigators, we're not just arbitrators, but we are peacemakers at the end of the day and, and where, where can we take uh, people to? So, and that's my take on that. Uh, Mr. Singh, over to you, sir. As you rightly said, Mr. Anil, that today in India, we find after the development is taking place and construction agreements are going on, two neighbors, I'll pick it from there and from where you left, we found that there were disputes that were not only relatable to construction, but relatable to who will get, for example, the FAR that has been given by the municipal corporation and municipalities. So there were disputes with respect to whether I would get 250 FAR or you would get 250 FAR. Now, the best was that the mediator was able to bring home, making two of them, and I thought as Madhyam, I must bring it to notice of my orders gathering that keeping in view that there were too many development in the complexes, especially residential complexes, disputes coming between two neighbors, as you rightly mentioned, we established a mediation center and uh, a Gurdwara was able to give us a space, which is fortunately placed in the South Delhi, where two mandirs and RWAs 
where we are able to resolve these disputes, which otherwise would take a lot of time in court. And I think construction activity will come to an end again. <laughs> the stoppage of construction has to know how much you have to deal with each other. <clears throat> so the mediators were able to resolve those issues with respect to the two neighbors for three reasons. One, <clears throat> construction activity continues in timelines that were already fixed or probably with some delays. And most important was that those two neighbors who were fighting with each other had a conflict would live with harmony, live with peace, live as two friends and probably live as part of that. That's one part. <clears throat> the larger concept we have seen I think the obligation is to take cast on our legal profession. And I've said that, especially after speaking at the pandemic situation, that if I get a brief, if I, somebody was to brief me, I must at the end of the day must decide that out of the 20 issues that have been come in this, and the best time is the time when after the pleadings are complete. And that is why the Arbitration Act today also considers the time limitation with the arbitral tribunal is post pleadings are complete. Because at that is the time the arbitral tribunal may also try to exercise section 30 what we have and send the matter to a mediator to see if we can resolve. Because out of those 20, if 10 get resolved, actually we have laid a path. And my experience as a mediator, as a counsel has been that we are a, there have been times when we have mediated for five disputes, we have come to a settlement. The remaining five went back to court or to the arbitral tribunal. And after some time, we again requested the arbitral tribunal of the court to please send it back to the same mediator and we were able to resolve the matter. So therefore, the legal practitioners today have an obligation to ensure A, that if I can out of 10 disputes resolve some, I must put that hand in front. And the Indian law has now been amended, especially in relation to commercial contracts, and which will include construction contracts, that if I give a reasonable proposal in the court, at the end of the day, the cost comes also to in my favor. So keeping that in view, we have to consider an obligation on ourselves as officers of the court, because we are not considered as though we are representing a party, that we must ensure that justice reads. After all, it is the truth that has to come in. And truth can best be come in when we empower both parties to come, because they know the best. They are. The mediator may be able to ask questions in negotiation skills. He may be able to extract many things. But they're all confidential. But parties themselves know where their case stands. And one thing more that I thought it is important for us to understand is we in believe that we should do. I especially look at this part, and my own many of my colleagues at Madhyam looks at this part. That I must put myself in the chair. If I put myself in the chair and see what would I react to, what should be my underlying interest in it? And if I'm able to identify that qua one party or the other, then as a mediator, we have been able to empower them to reach that destination which they're actually looking forward but probably not able to look at it because of a or b reasons so if hard reality is able we are able to extract that on the mediation table to say and make him realize that if i am in the chair and i see this is what the end result is going to be <laughs> if we were to agree to that parties would negotiate parties would come to a conclusion and probably see how best we can do and a construction industry is complicated, it's integrated. It's not a simple dispute of money lending or something. There's so many authorities involved. There's so many other people involved. There's the labor involved. There's a third party's interest involved. Therefore, keeping all those interests, keeping those all those intricacies, the best method available to us to ensure that how do we resolve them by empowering them to realize that if you were in the chair, how would you react to their situation? And if we are able to reach that, and in India, I think my friend has rightly quoted the Chief Justice of the United States. We have Mahatma Gandhi who said that, Abraham Lincoln who said that. Mahatma Gandhi, in fact, said, I have not lost any practice even after I've gone to mediation. My friend Anil has said he has been in the practice for so long. We all have been in the practice of mediation from 2006, as I said, as I began today. So on, with respect to one of the motives and one of the principles on which Madhyam is today basing itself is the fact how do I reach out to people to ensure conflicts can be resolved? How I reach out to people to say, and that's why I think the first concept of pre-litigation mediation is this only, that before you take hard stands and lawyers are able to put in their might and see how they use their ingenuity and bring their facts before the court or, a, or an arbitral tribunal, you may make parties realize and make them sit down 
it is possible. And I think if all goes well in the mediation bill as proposed by us, really sees the light of the day and we bring it as an act, we'll find every dispute before it go, knocks down to a tribunal or to an authority or to a court, of course, or including an arbitral tribunal should be able to. And I think we should appreciate that in India, an arbitral tribunal and a court, civil court, both in terms of Section 89 of CPC and in terms of Section 30 of the Arbitration Act is empowered and that the why the legislature gave that leverage to both of them to see why can't you ensure mediation process is taken note of at any stage we have seen in fact i am very proud that we have this is sanjay kishan called today as the judge of the supreme court this is secret was just who's now the judge of the singapore commercial court they have resolved disputes right up to the singapore uh, right up to the supreme court when fatigue of litigation had gone through people had litigated they've taken their stands but then the court actually prepared the parties for mediation. So a lot of time, the court's role becomes important. Lawyers' role become important to ensure how best we can achieve. And in India, at least, I've seen cross-border is another way that we have seen people in Mauritius, people in Nepal. Now, with respect to, especially after we have gone from Nepal to Bangladesh, with respect to fabrication of our garments, etc., many disputes got resolved which would, of course, cross border in that sense of the matter, but only because court's intervention came in. The lawyer's intervention came in and both of them actually prepared the parties to go to a mediator and mediator like Mr. Anil was able to bring home both of them together and we were able to resolve the disputes. That's where we are looking at future of mediation as going to be the best in this country for we are now looking at to make it, as I said earlier, a way of life. Thank you. I think what's what's critical. We we only have about four minutes left, but uh, what is critical about what you said is that we need to we need to train the Indian mediators and empower them with all the skills that you've just spoken about. And that's why I, I mentioned that I've done uh, training on restorative justice. Uh, and also another another very interesting thing that I've just done uh, earlier this year was uh, emotional caution. Uh, I, I, I'm now qualified to coach people on emotional caution to figure out how my mind works and possibly how the other party's minds work. So exactly what you said, you want to get into the role of the, of the party and figure out what they want as well. So it's very important. Let me just, just uh, make some concluding remarks uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I thought it's really important that parties realize that uh, in, in India itself, right, uh, you have... A tradition, you have a culture, you have all of these things that are really in place uh, in India uh, to take mediation forward, right? You have, uh, I, I thought the Mahabharata was, 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 was a perfect example of how negotiations are done. Uh, uh, the Gandhi uh, Irving Pact uh, in the, on the 5th of March 1931 showcases how you went into negotiations instead of, of having it disputed or going to an international court of arbitration or whatever, right? But you appreciate that you really have the fundamentals and the culture in you. It's just about being trained a little bit more in terms of mediation so that you can take it forward because it becomes very, very important. All right. Uh, and then, and I just wanted to leave you last with this, uh, uh, this thing that uh, at the World Economic Forum uh, uh, in the middle of last year, uh, the, 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 these gentlemen here quoted this and said this, right? Is it, is it societies could be poised to become either more equitable or as opposed geared towards more solida solidarity or a greater individualism you pick you want to work together or you want to be an individual and stay with being an individual favoring the interests of the few or looking to the needs of the many economies when they recover could be characterized by greater inclusivity and more um, attuned to our global co our commons so you find that this pandemic has put us in an environment that we really want to go forward right will there be enough collective will to take advantage of this unprecedented opportunity to to reimagine our world in a bit to make it better and more resilient one uh, as to uh, as it emerges from the other side of this pandemic so you find that we are in this state so why don't you just turn to mediation and see where it can take you right so those are the last comments we just have about a minute or so there were two questions in in the in the chat one was the concept of compulsory mediation, uh, whether in Singapore or elsewhere. You find that in many, many jurisdictions, the, the question about compulsory, could we just quickly br just bring everybody back uh, for a quick minute so that I can thank everyone else, right? Uh, so 
Uh, you know, if you understand the fundamentals of mediation, you know that it's a consensual approach. So trying to impose and then forcing it down may be a difficult exercise to go down the path of. But uh, Mr. Singh also spoke about the pre-litigation mediation. Uh, there was a question on that as well. But what you, you hear from all of our, our speakers is that if you take it down the path of mediation, you're going to find matters being resolved a lot faster, a lot more to the satisfaction. Could I just have asked for a last word from each of you? I start with Sue, please. Just yeah, one quick of, last yeah, In terms of voluntary mediation, as I mentioned earlier, media, in the UK, mediation is currently a voluntary process. And, but there is there has been a recent movement towards mandatory ADR. In South Korea, there's a, there's a mediation act and other legislation, but still, it's still quite slow to adopt mediation as the first form of dispute resolution. Okay. Uh, Philip? Well, I said very quickly that uh, the American Institute of Architects, uh, in its standard form, which is used very widely throughout the United States, provides for mediation as a precondition for arbitration or litigation. And uh, uh, it's the industries, the, the contractual provisions that uh, are including mediation and other forms of dispute resolution as well. And we've got another set of forms, consensus documents that provides for structured negotiations and then mediation and going on. But uh, it's it's the industry, the construction industry, more than the uh, legislation. Right. Thank you. Ms. Singh, over to you. Uh, to me, after we have brought in 2016 Act with respect to insolvency, and now we have brought the personal insolvency, I found the construction industry, more people were going into resolutions restructuring. And that's where we found mediation as a process being taken in even when there was nothing in the we had in the companies act a mediation section but we did not have that yet <laughs> grateful to the adjudicating authorities and the appellate authority in the supreme court where we brought this concept of mediation incorporated by their own decisions and we found many decisions many places where people were able to do it therefore the construction industry especially in relation to even in relation to reconstruction even in relation to repayment plans needs the art of understanding what mediation is because it only empowers them helps them to do their business better and grateful to all of you on behalf of madhyam at this juncture and mr anil phillips and Tuli for being with us and grateful to the organizers for giving this session to madhyam Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've taken two minutes into the, the, the end of the session. Incredible. Thank you all for sharing our views. Uh, and that's it. Over back to the host. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, everyone, for the insightful session. Our next session will start in 30 minutes here in Auditorium 2, which will be a workshop on driver threat, construction consultancy, and dials export witness services. We have a very important topic, the alternative FIDIC workshop, discussing the amended clauses faced in everyday working life. Meanwhile, you can meet and greet with the other delegates in the meeting room that can be found in the lobby.